So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Emily Cottrell, and I'm an assistant director here at NISTS, and we're so pleased to have you with us. Uh, today, we're asking the question, uh, what does it mean to be a transfer advocate when the idea of free college is central to the current national debate about the role of higher education in strengthening our democracy and the lives of our students? And we're so pleased to have with us today uh, two just outstanding authors, uh, Lean Strempel and Steve Handel, could have a really great conversation. I want to go through just a couple of housekeeping rules. So, you know, today's webinar will last about 50 minutes, and we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end. We'll reserve that just for the Q&A. If you have a question, please do put that in the Q&A box. Um, you should see that QA box button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We do have chat open, so you're welcome to chat with each other, but we're not going to be monitoring the chat for questions specifically. So if you want to ask something specifically to the panelists, be sure you put it in the QA box. Uh, as I mentioned, we are recording the webinar so that you can view it on demand later if you'd like. I'll send you an email with the link and uh, the recording and a copy of today's slides. If we end up with any kind of handout or anything, I'll send that to you in a day or two, so keep an eye out for that. And then finally, we'd love to hear your feedback about the session. So please consider filling out our quick post webinar survey at the end of the session. Um, we'll chat a link to that at the end, uh, but it'll also be in the follow up email. So that's it for housekeeping, pretty easy stuff. I'm really excited now to turn it over to Janet Marley. She's our executive director here at NISTS. So she's gonna introduce you to our panelists. So take it away, Janet, and welcome again, everyone. We're so glad that everyone's here with us today. Hey, Emily, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I was so excited to see the list of participants because you all are spanning institutional types. You're spanning geographical boundaries, functional areas, uh, a great mix. So I, I'm super excited, mainly because we all know that transfer cannot be an issue that we're solving just within our own piece of our institutions or our organizations. It's something that has to be looked at across our ecosystems. So the fact that you all are here representing different aspects of the ecosystem are so very important. And for those of you who have multiple uh, professionals joining us from the same institution or organization, kudos to you. And please take time, I hope, to loop back toward one another at the end of this or sometime in the upcoming days or week, just to talk through what you learned today and how that might potentially impact your campus. Because we're gonna be looking at both the higher education landscape, looking at transfer, and then looking very specifically at some of those strategies that you can use as we are moving into the next academic year. Now, I don't have to tell any of you just how tumultuous life has been and the pressure that we're all under, um, whether it's really renewing and, and, and ensuring our commitment to equity and access for our racially minoritized students and other students from uh, challenged and under-resourced backgrounds, whether it is trying to reach out to those students who potentially have stopped out of higher education due to the pandemic and are trying to find their way back in, or if it's just navigating those, those personal challenges that you've had over the last over a year now of balancing the expectations of work and trying to ensure that your own mental health is intact as you're responding to the ever flowing, changing, dynamic higher education landscape that we're dealing with right now. So we welcome all of you into this conversation today at whatever kind of level that you're joining us. And we are very excited because pre-pandemic, both Eileen and Steve have been thinking about that landscape of higher education and thinking about what it means, how it's working, how it's not been working for our 20th century, 21st century students. And in that they've come to it with a very laser focus on transfer and as transfer advocates. They both serve as advisory board members for NISTS and we've benefited for a long time from their, their um, warrior-like championing of transfer, their knowledge and their willingness to really stake their claim around this issue. So they've been thinking about transfer for quite some time, but since the pandemic have really been able to also think through the consequences of some of the things that have been brought forward in their book. So whenever we um, ask them to come and share some insights about 
their research over the last couple of years, they jumped at the chance and we're very grateful. And we felt like this was a great time of the summer to say, okay, we are hopefully starting to get a sense of what the fall might look like at our various institutions. And then also thinking into what does it look like once those folks are engaged again in the fall semester and moving forward. So we have a lot to talk about. And I would just like to say thank you to Eileen and Steve for joining us today and say your hellos to the group. Thank you so much for, for hosting us here. And thank you, not just to you, Janet, and to Emily, and to Judith, but to everyone at NISTS for, for welcoming so warmly Stephen and I here today. We're yeah, delighted we're to join you. Absolutely thrilled. And, and to the folks who are on the webinar who I can't see, we actually saw the list before. Uh, and I have a lot of one, well, you're all great colleagues, and some of them I know personally. So thanks for joining us. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. Thank you both. We are going to go through a just a, a conversation, if you will, about um, you know the book itself, and then moving into some specific strategies for advocacy. But first of all, you know, as we were preparing for this, it occurred to me that writing a book is a little bit like going to college. Now, you all can dispute that. You two can dispute that or, or agree. When I think about it, it's like you enter into this, this project with one idea of how things are going to turn out. And then your experience either confirms or maybe both confirms or completely upends your expectations. So can you two each share an example of how um, the book itself um, morphed and perhaps met or challenged your expectations? It's a great uh, question, Janet. And actually, uh, uh, Eileen and I talked about it during the writing of the book. We learned so much. And that was, I, I guess, the greatest blessing because writing a book is, is a pain. Um, uh, it's a very hard thing to do, but, but you learn things and you learn important things. And so for me, one of the, one of the things I learned was when we started this, this was really about you know, this was really about vertical transfer. This was about traditional two-year to four-year transfer. Um, and what I learned was that there's a much broader world uh, for transfer students. And I'll, I'll read you a quote we have from the book from uh, Doug Sapiro, who of course is with, uh, with the Clearinghouse. He says, over half of all students on a typical campus at any given point in time, on average are mobile students. They either came from somewhere, uh, will go somewhere else, or both before finishing a degree. And I guess I sort of knew that, but uh, the plain fact of the matter is for all of you advocates out there is there are more transfer students than anybody else going to higher education right now. And so we are key levers uh, to advancing their work. So that was, that was one of the things I learned. And just building on what, what Steve has shared, uh, yes to exactly what he said, and I would even take it a step farther that as we started to delve into all these different types of transfer, a really a more fundamental question emerged. And that is we invest so much as a country in higher education. There's all these different types of academic credit from, from IB to early college high school to credit you might earn at a community college to um, competency-based education to prior learning assessment. And it really, um, we really started to wonder what really works. You know, what not, um, and not just in an isolated study, but in replicated research that has also actually been brought to life on campuses. Where, is, where do we have these successful research tested demonstration models that we could offer? And um, so I think as the, as the book emerged, Janet, we really started to think about our nation's investment in higher education much more broadly. And really um, a burning question for us by the, by the culmination of the book is, how do we all as, as transfer advocates out, um, out, out there doing good work in the world, how do we help students not just have access to college, but actually complete college, that there are 36 million Americans out there with some college and no degree. What's the most successful way to reach them and to help them earn that life transforming credential? Yeah, that, that's a, a great segue into one of my questions here, Eileen, and that's the notion that at NISTS, we are really particularly interested in getting students to that credential, um, getting them to completion. So from your perspective in the book, you, you, you've got some pretty strong feelings around that. So why is it imperative then that we talk very clearly and specifically about students earning college degrees? 
Well, you know, as as uh, we see oft repeated in the news, we ha um, we have a the worst of both worlds. Sometimes we have students who have some college but no degree, and then on top of that are carrying student loan debt. And it's only with that credential that your lifetime earnings um, and your possibilities and really transforming not just the life of yourself, but of your family are possible. And so we really, um, we really wanted to take a keen focus on the cost per degree completed. It's, it's not access, right? Most of us can, can take an online course at a, at a community college pretty close to us for, for fairly cheap. Um, so it, it's beyond um, just the mere cost of college. Um, and in fact, that's probably not the best metric. Most, most companies um, try to figure out for, for their final product how much it costs to produce that. And so Stephen, I really urge that we need to have as a sector, a keen eye on the cost per degree earned. And that sometimes, the life costs, the childcare, the metro card, the books, addressing housing insecurity um, and uh, food insecurity, that those wraparound life supports, providing the resources for those does cost more upfront, but the cost per degree is so much lower because those students actually complete their degrees. So um, we, uh, we were really inspired by, by writing this um, also just by our nation's history with the GI Bill and uh, urge that as we, um, that we're in this pandemic emergent time, urge us as a country to think of fighting this battle um, with a similar type of investment in higher education in a modern day GI Bill. I, I, I would only add, I mean, it's, it's just key uh, to sort of think beyond access. And that's, some, that's a theme that's going to come through it. And that's hard for folks who are at uh, full access or uh, open access institutions, um, because they see, they see that as, as the necessary entree. And, and we don't disagree with any of that. Um, but the key now, and I think study after study proves, is that students with sub-baccalaureate or baccalaureate degrees are more likely um, to succeed in, in, in a both a career and in life. And uh, honestly, I don't know that we in higher education, that's across selectivity levels, have done a, a good enough job, honest, honestly, um, to think about what it takes to move students towards degrees. And so I think that's going to be the key challenge for us going forward. And that's a, a lot of what we talk about in the book. So that equity factor, that social mobility factor, most definitely playing into that. So when we think about what students were referring to, you you coined an interesting term of neo-traditional, and you paint this broad picture of what students today look like. So give us a sense of who these students are, and most importantly, what makes them invaluable to colleges and universities, whether public, private, geographic, however that might look. Yes, Steve and I coined the term neo-traditional students. Who, who are these 21st century students? And I think one of the realizations that we came across was that this is the new majority um, and no longer are the, you know, the, the picture of the dewy-eyed 18-year-old in the college brochure. That's not the typical college student. In fact, over 70% of American college students are either, either first generation low income Pell eligible from a historically underrepresented community, a working parent um, and or a first generation college student. And nearly 70% fall into one or more of those categories. So I think we were just stunned by what our new normal as a country looks like. All of these trends had existed before COVID. Now they're even more, more relevant and more important to really think about. Um, and sometimes, and we, we all have uh, lived in various institutions with more or less resources. So the responses are going to shift based on institutional type, whether you serve as a, as a connective tissue, um, whether you actually start to house a, a, a home to a, a, a food pantry or et cetera. But the, the important thing here is that each institution needs to respond to who today's students are. Um, and really thinking much more broadly about their recruitment and, again, about their retention and graduation. Yeah, and I, again, I would only add, I mean, for the pragmatists among you, those of you who are at four-year institutions, for instance, or actually any institutions, I mean, uh, uh, the demographic shift um, is real. 
And there's a real cliff that's going to happen in the middle of this decade on which the number of high school graduates is going to decline and rather significantly. So if, if colleges and institutions are interested in staying open, um, they're going to need to accommodate themselves in some key ways to the students that Eileen just talked about. Um, so for institutional survival alone, um, we're going to have to sort of rethink who we reach out to um, and think about how we serve them better. And, and we have some notions about that um, in, in, in the book. Great. Before we get to some of those specifics, I really want to pick your brain for just a minute. You titled the book Beyond Free College. Um, you saw under your crystal ball that various states had an interest in potentially offering different types of access, whether it be free community college, free bridge programs, freezing tuition, whatever that might look like. Um, so as you're thinking about this from a policy perspective, we're putting money potentially into getting students that access piece that you talked about, but what do our policymakers and our legislators and our administrators and those of us who are carrying out those directives need to be considering to ensure that those, those neo-traditional students are getting what they need then to make that transition, presumably through transfer in many cases, to that earned degree? Um, so we really take a focus on a lot of the wraparound policies and supports that, that students really need to complete their degrees. Um, one of the models that we looked at is the ASAP program in New York City that's housed mm -hmm. by CUNY, but has been replicated at community colleges and, and states across the country, most notably Ohio, where the return um, on investment, again, we acknowledge that the costs of the upfront costs are higher, um, but the cost per degree completed is about almost $6,000 per degree cheaper um, and then results in a long-term return to the taxpayer investment of nearly five to one because that student is now, is now going to be having a higher paid job. So they're going to pay higher taxes. They're less likely to need social services or be incarcerated. And then here's where it gets magical. And their children are much, much more likely not only to attend college, but also to complete. So in a certain sense, the, the benefits be, almost become incalculable. And, and, I, and I think that's what really excited Steve and I is just like, as a country, we're investing so much. And if we just get this right, if we're a little more nuanced and use the research wisely, we'll be able to understand what students really need. Um, one of the pieces that all of you out there that um, I would encourage uh, each of you, no matter what type of campus you're on, if you're not already broadly using prior learning assessment, um, to really take a look at how that might be implemented on a broad scale at your campus. Um, one of the, uh, to me, blessings, as Steve mentioned about middle age is doing research is sometimes you find out you're completely wrong. So I will admit um, abject skepticism to the whole idea of prior learning assessment. I think I was maybe a, a typical faculty member and saying, oh, I don't want to be giving away credit and that doesn't really work. And I, I, I'm really uncomfortable with the whole notion. But the research is incontrovertible. It's, it's so compelling. Students when awarded only nine credits for prior learning assessment are then two and a half times more likely to graduate. Two and a half. If you knew something was not just twice as effective, but even more so, why wouldn't you do it? And um, here's another transformative insight that, uh, that I had is that, gosh, um, you know, as institutions, we have been urging our students to go out there and find internships, and we have found ways of making that work-based learning uh, rigorous and something that we feel comfortable awarding academic credit for, for our traditional students. It really became a social justice issue for us. If we can do it for our traditional students, why can't we do it for our neo-traditional students? Especially when the benefits to those students are so great and frankly, to the institution, because if those students are, are two and a half times as likely to graduate, that's more tuition revenue. They're going to stay with you and they're going to complete and be happy alums. So there, there was just a lot of these kind of revelatory um, moments in writing of this book where, where we found out we were wrong, but we were so excited about what we discovered. 
you can see very clearly why it was so much fun to write with Eileen because she's so passionate and she also makes reference to me as middle-aged, which I just think is adorable. So thank you again for that, Eileen. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention, Janet, was, uh, and I think this is key, particularly for the advocates out there with free community college or free college in general, we're not antithetical to that notion at all. Um, the, the title is very deliberate. Beyond free college simply means yes, absolutely access is key. Um, it, it, that's one of the greatest things that American higher education can do is have that open access, but we're going to need, need to do more and that investment needs to be targeted and strategic. Um, it isn't enough just to offer access. We've had access, for instance, in California um, for since the start of the, uh, the California master plan. Uh, community colleges in this state are very welcoming, very open, um, but, but to help our neo-traditional students get to those certificates, sub-bac or baccalaureate degrees, we're going to have to do a lot more than just open our doors. Truly, and you, you brought up the notion of the ASAP program, and I, I'm just putting myself in the shoes of our audience who may say, yes, I've heard about that. That sounds great. They're so well resourced. How in the world would something like that translate to my institution, my, my little slice of the, the higher education world? So as you think about ways that you could potentially help those um, who are interested but maybe uncertain as to how to start thinking about that larger scale and making the exact argument that you're putting forward is that investment up front is so critical to that actual benefit and cost of degree in the end. What are some just tips there around getting the ball rolling? That's a great question. Um, and part of it is, I think part of the difficulty that a lot of folks, particularly transfer advocates have when they approach this work is it's like it's too overwhelming. And yet the people on this call know very clearly that a good deal of what um, has to be done is, is building collaborations and building alliances on your campus alone. Um, the book certainly doesn't argue for a whole scale change in terms of the way in which higher education is operated. All we're saying um, is that there are many uh, uh, targeted programs and services that make a difference. There's a particular statistic in here that Eileen brought to me early in the writing of the book, and, and I, I, may get it quite, I may get it wrong, but I think there's about a third of all community college students um, uh, have children. Um, and uh, that's huge. And it made us think, well, why is childcare so hard to get then? Um, it, it just seems to us that um, if, if you have a child, going to college is secondary. You have to take care of your child. It, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, though. But then we did wonder, so why is child care often uh, so insufficient? And so even one of the arguments we have in there is very, very simple. How do we advocate for greater capacity on our particular campus for something as simple as child care? And, and now I understand it, it's not a simple thing. Uh, it is expensive. But it's key to having our neo-traditional students actually get to campus and earn the degree. So a lot of the stuff we argue in here is not abstract. Uh, it's pretty concrete. Um, and you don't have to do it all because many of our campuses are doing a good deal of, of, of these things. It's the combination and the strategic targeting of it that, that, that'll be key. Eileen, what did I miss? I would also um, just urge folks to to start small. You know, if you you know, knowing that that the time is is short right now, and that a lot of these partnerships do take time, um, but with the realization that by um, just by instituting a prior learning assessment uh, program and creating some important linkages with businesses in your community to make sure that any workplace-based learning that's happening, that you're creating bridges back into higher education to reach some of those 36 million Americans with some college and no degree. Another piece that we would really urge, and this is a, a longer term project, is really to think of some, some restructuring of the way that institutions do business in a way that truly keeps a student center. Um, and these are, again, are, are not earth shattering to, to those professionals out there, right? Block scheduling to facilitate to working adults being able to, you know, blend both their work and life. I'm not going to say balance because I don't know if that works. Um, another one is to really think about those uh, those models out there, again, that are working. And here I want to shout out Brigham Young University with this wonderful ethos of, of no credit left behind. Again, we hear about it stackable certificates, but they're, it's working and in a way that really acknowledges that, that people swirl in higher education. 
So you may start out with a, a certificate in, in retail management that then leads to an associate's degree in business and then a bachelor's degree in business. But what this kind of structure really does is it acknowledges that people are gonna come in and out, but when they leave, it's not gonna be with some college, no degree. They're gonna leave with some college and a credential. And that credential is really gonna transform their lifelong earnings. And it will incentivize them to come back and then stack on the next credential. And I think a lot of us have talked about some of these things, we haven't actually done it. And we haven't actually marketed it to a way that's really, to, that's really student focused and student centered. Um, and when we do that, the results are, are, are truly awe-inspiring. Um, some of these models that, that Steve and I looked at over the course of writing this book um, really took my breath away. So, so not only is the research there, those, those replicable models are out there and inspiring us all. Janet, if, if you don't mind, uh, just to add, you know, we didn't come up with this stuff out of whole cloth. That's the other thing we want to emphasize mm -hmm. in the book. We're, we're calling the good work and the research of many of the people who are probably on this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to see themselves or their, their institutions. That's what we're trying to push here. We didn't, uh, this is not off in a corner thinking about it in an ivory tower. This is about, well, what's, what's work? Um, and so that was also the exciting part of, of doing this book. Well, that's great because we're all about practical perspectives. And when we know those exemplars that are out there, it's really important. So you mentioned Brigham Young University, no credit left behind or no credit behind. What, what was the name of the program? No credit left behind. Thank you. Okay, great. So check that out for sure. Um, we also are just curious to know, did you find specific prior learning assessment um, programs that you would recommend people take a look at as well? Um, you know, there's a wonderful national organization, CAEL, um, and they are, I think, just, just do absolutely fantastic work. And they really build on uh, our nation's wonderful history in this arena. I don't know if some of you know the kind of the, the history behind it. It's, it's really, um, again, just inspiring. Uh, in the wake of World War II, when we had a lot of our veterans returning, our country was really trying to find a way of how do we how do we give credit for all that learning that happened in the military? How do we speed our, our returning GIs uh, through their, their uh, higher education degree pathway and into a career? And that was really the birth of prior learning assessment was in the wake of World War II and ACE led that uh, initiative. But now it has much more broad applications, not just in the military, which continues and is held at over 95% of campuses around the country. Um, but it builds on that resounding success and that almost universal acceptance mm -hmm. to now extend into workplace-based learning in a way that just really, really keeps a, a keen eye on social justice and equity. Um, but boy, that, that's, uh, that's inspiring. So if you're looking to try to implement it, CAEL is really the organization that, that can um, help in a, in a variety of different ways that, you know, very low intervention to they'll take care of it for you. And they really have a very terrorist uh, service model, but they uh, are wonderful exemplars for how to get it right. For many of you as well who are on campuses, I, I would bet money that you probably already have a prior learning policy, maybe it's not called that, on your campus, as Eileen mentioned before, because it sort of has been on the books. So I have former life at the University of California, and I know I have some UC folks on the call here, and I think they will resonate to this. We, we have opportunities to provide credit for people if, uh, if, um, you know, if they have that credit and, and, and it works for their degrees. The problem is some of these policies have laid dormant for decades. And I don't know that, I don't know that we're really leveraging them appropriately, but they're already there. So in working with faculty and then having them, of course, understand what the neo-traditional student has looked like, how does that work for your campus? So it's not the hard work of creating a policy, it's probably there. It's really refashioning it um, for the 21st century. Yeah, that's a really good point in the sense that I think there probably are a lot of pieces and pockets of excellence happening across our campuses and we just need to connect the dots and start thinking about it with our transfer lens and how then if we are doing this and bringing um, these types of increased services to our transfer students, it's only going to benefit all of our campus constituents. Um, if we're getting students into and through our institutions more economically in, in kind of a, a more uh, quick fashion such that they can move on into the workforce or potentially move into graduate school. So 
as we kind of before we get into thinking about more of these these exemplar programs, I'm wondering if there were any themes that emerged as you were looking at these different programs. You you've talked about PLA was really important, um, ensuring that that you had these wraparound services for students. But are there others that might point to how we are taking good care of some of our more vulnerable populations? I'll take a stab at that. I mean, one of them, of course, uh, something that many of the advocates out there have been dealing with is how to honor um, student credit, or rather uh, two things, how to honor student realities. We've talked about the student realities, children um, having to, as Eileen said, blend work uh, with family and school. Um, how, do we, how do we honor that in, in this new century? Um, and then the other part, of course, is how do we honor that credit? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not an easy issue. I mean, we've we struggled this with this for a long time, but there are good exemplars of the ways in which institutions can use credit in ways that advance students successfully. We're not talking about here grant every piece of credit towards you know every degree. Um, you know, sometimes politicians get the notion that when credit doesn't apply towards the degree, they want to sort of force institutions to do that, and we know that doesn't work. It has to make sense coherently, intellectually, academically, um, and yet we've got examples in the book of institutions that really do honor that credit well and in ways that advance students, and, and the research, as Eileen said, is unassailable. Um, we, see, we see students gaining a certain kind of academic momentum uh, when they see how the credits connect. So it may be as simple as providing a website or providing, for instance, as we have in California in ASSIST, um, the, the opportunity for students to plan ahead and to see how that credit, credit works. Um, but that's, that's what I think are some of the themes that came out of the book. Eileen, what, what comes to mind for you? So I'll, I'll take a, a slightly different tack here. Um, one of the things to return to a point I would made earlier in our conversation was really trying to understand out of all these substantial investments that we're all working so hard and with such dedication towards what works. And so one of the things we also did was looking back to the high school years. And um, many of you out there, whether you're on two-year campuses or four-year campuses, have wonderful partnerships with your high schools. And there's lots of different types of partnerships. You know, sometimes um, it's the deputizing of a high school teacher to teach that community college course. Um, and sometimes it is actually a completion of a community college associate's degree while still in high school. Sometimes it's having that student come to the two or four-year campus. And so those are really three broadly defined different models for how to approach you know, early college high school models. And out of those three, again, the research is very compelling in terms of longitudinal benefit. And what I mean by that, that you're more likely to complete your baccalaureate degree and do it in the shortest amount of time, which of those three models is the most effective? And the answer? It's the one where those students come to that to your campus, the two and four year college campus. There's something about um, that a different being in a different milieu in a different classroom setting and just understanding that the, the bar has shifted. Something about being in that different social, intellectual, academic context that, that truly is transforming to those students. Um, so since we know that, why aren't all of our models like that? And if you have an early college high school program out there, now is the time to really perhaps reimagine it and for the long-term success, not just of those students, but then if those students come onto your campus as part of an early college program, they're more likely, excuse me, they're more likely to stay with you. So there, there are both personal and institutional benefits. Um, so all along, um, I, I just one revelation after another was just like, why are we doing it so many different ways when clearly one way is so far superior? Um, and uh, I really um, was inspired by the research and in um, talks like this really hope to convey to people the importance of, of listening to, to researchers so that we really can make the most of our nation's investments in higher education. So it sounds like, again, partnerships are a linchpin 
looking at your current configuration and understanding where potentially we're putting up roadblocks for our students unnecessarily, and then really diving into the research to say what is working and what you have just provided for us is, is, is a, the, the Cliff Notes version, the shortcut. We, we, we have established in this book several different types of programs that are working. Um, we know that each institution has a different way potentially that they would then need to shift such that would work for their environment, um, kind of noting that transfer is a local phenomenon, yet you, you have some of these, these under, underpinnings as to what can happen. So let's think for a minute about those individuals who are in the trenches. We have advisors on this call. We have admission teams on this call, transfer coordinators um, who are on this webinar, as well as decision makers. So helping them to figure out that place, you said start small earlier. And I think figuring out individual spheres of influence and where they want to start and how they can message better is really an important part of this process because right now we have such competing means for our attention. We are trying to survive this, this pandemic and, and reemergence from that. Um, so what are your thoughts for those out there who are working directly with students who might feel like their spheres of influence are a little smaller than what you're suggesting, how can they contribute to moving toward some of those really high impact practices you're discussing? Well, first of all, I just wanna salute all of those advisors out there because you truly do make the student world run. Um, I, I have yet to meet a student who didn't uh, thank their advisor as one of their top uh, folks on their team that made it possible for them to get through the, the goal line there. So I just, a huge shout out to all the advisors out there. Um, I really think that a lot of the research that we uncovered just uh, reinforces what a lot of you already do, which is really look at the whole student, but it really is thinking much more intentionally, um, uh, a check sheet, if you will, that really makes sure that that student isn't housing insecure, and if so, what are the local resources that you can connect them to? If they have food insecurity, what are the local resources you can help them connect to? What are the childcare resources? Do they need a computer? Do they need Wi-Fi access? Because just because you have a computer doesn't mean you have Wi-Fi access and vice versa. Um, you know, really thinking about all of the components that go into successfully navigating the higher education gauntlet and providing, helping, playing as that advisor, a different type of connector role. You're not just connecting that student to the needed classes and a, and a schedule that works with their home and work life. You're also, if you really want to think about completion, need to think about all these other components of that student's life. And, and I know a lot of you already do that. Um, and one last thing I'll say is the importance of helping to navigate the financial aid gauntlet. Um, and so or if there are volunteers, if there are um, connective tissues that you have in your own community, um, for a lot of first generation students, for our nation's neo-traditional students, for anyone, those forms are, are just uh, quite intimidating. Sometimes you're trying to find documents uh, from a parent that you've been estranged from for, for years. It really can be an intimidating nightmare. Um, so just please understand um, and please let us celebrate you for all the important work you do. Uh, your job has always been tough and in this pandemic time has only become more challenging. Uh, and I would add on, on, on one front or a couple of fronts, I'm an old admissions and enrollment guy uh, or middle age perhaps. Um, but in any event, um, uh, you know, from that vantage point for you enrollment strategists out there, I mean, uh, again, as we've talked about the demographic cliff, obviously transfers are going to be more, uh, more critical than ever. Let me encourage you to talk with your provost or who others who are part of that to make, for instance, community college transfer students a separate part of your enrollment strategy. And when I say separate, I mean different from your first year students um, in terms of enrollment targets, in terms of, of the, way in term, the way in which you think about them and their transition. Not because everything Thing is different between those two sets of students, but because there are some key differences uh, that will help your institution, uh, uh, you know, encourage those students to come to your institution, which more and more <clears throat> you're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to uh, enable uh, yourself to do. The other thing I would add is we're seeing this on a lot of campuses, and some of you may already be leading the charge. You know, uh, advisors are so key, but they can't 
be there all the time, right? I mean, they can't be there 24 hours a day. So how do we convey information um, at, at, at times when the advisor isn't available? Well, a lot of places are going to chat boxes. They're going to all the things that Best Buy has uh, in terms of reaching out and allowing you to at least submit questions on a, in, in a real-time basis. Uh, because transfer students or neo-traditional -tra students don't often have, they don't often know what they don't know, right? They don't have that experience. And so questions are gonna pop up, issues are gonna pop up at all times of the day or night. So let's think about the channels that we can use, simple, straightforward uh, connections that allow students to get answers to the questions that'll be key for them to come to your institution. One other thing I would say that emerging from this pandemic that, that all advisors and all of us are, are gonna be coping with is the fact that more than half of our students are gonna be on our campuses for the first time. So, um, you know, if you're a four-year institution, your first-year students have never been to campus, of course, but perhaps now your second-year students haven't. Your incoming transfer students, your third years have never been to campus, but also your seniors who are only gonna have one year on your, on your academic campus. Um, so the, the role of the advisors in helping to foster communities of support and near peer mentors, recognizing just that what Steve said that you can't do it all, um, but thinking this summer proactively about the very special needs of, of transfer students and how you can empower your students to be some of those mentors to, to help um, provide some, some advice from folks who might have a slightly different perspective than, than middle-aged us. So in thinking about that too, and that, that, that advocacy piece and thinking about those passionate transfer professionals who've been working tirelessly over the course of the last year in new and different ways. You, you all wrote a blog post for NISTS that talked a little bit about what you've, what you've examined post your book and how that nicely dovetails. Are there any specific advocacy pieces that kind of come from that post book consideration um, that you might want to share with folks? Uh, well, a couple of things come to mind. I mean, it's interesting for all of us now that we're, you know, emerging from that pandemic. What a hit, for instance, community colleges really took with regard to enrollment. And it was something that many of us, honestly, we talk about this in the blog, didn't, didn't see coming. Um, we didn't realize um, that that sort of counter cyclical sort of phenomenon would not just reemerge, um, that students would flock to community colleges in the wake of not being able to go to four-year institutions. But in fact, the opposite was true. And one of the things was, um, as Eileen mentioned earlier, um, connections with the internet and connections with the appropriate bandwidth. And you think, well, we should have thought of that. In the well, I guess we did, but it, it makes community colleges even more key because many of these students need to be on that campus in order to access the internet, in order to access, access that online stuff. And it's kind of a refuge as well. So more than ever, and I think we are gonna see a rebound, um, although don't bet money on it, I was, I was wrong about the other one, um, but, uh, but I think we're gonna see a reemergence of the importance of community colleges for, for neo-traditional students because that's gonna be the place, that's gonna be the hub. Um, where they're going to begin the work towards certificates, degrees, and what have you. And the internet is going to be like housing. It's going to be like food. It's, it's not a resource that's a luxury anymore. It's going to be key uh, for students getting degrees. And I would add to that that I think um, that in post-pandemic, we've understood in a new way how educational institutions, whether it's an elementary school, a high school, a community college, or a four-year campus, they're much more than just educational providers. They are incredible resources to their communities and do provide access points, not just for education, but for food pantries, for, for, uh, for internet, for so much more. And so I think um, one of the things post pandemic is that we're realizing the importance of place um, and as we did the research in the book, one of the things that really became apparent was these place-based supports are so essential for neo-traditional student success. And of course, as we all know from reading the news, post-pandemic, it's, it's the, it's the neo-traditional students that were, that were hurt the hardest, where the enrollments have gone down 10% or even more. Um, there's one uh, high school principal plaintively spoke in this morning's New York Times, how many more students do we need to lose? 
Um, and so I, I really think that it builds upon some of the, the energy of the conclusion of the book where we really start to focus on those 36 million Americans with some college and no degree and thinking about personalized um, marketing campaigns that encourage reconnections. There's so many educational off ramps. We all need to be very intentional, dependent on, on each of our communities about what kinds of educational on ramps are we building? Because there's a lot of students who have stopped out in the pandemic that we need to be really intentional about connecting to while we create a more receptive ecosystem on our campus to welcome them. I mean, that just is a, a beautiful illustration of what, what action can be taken now by anybody at any institution. And it's examining where students potentially have gotten off track and how they can then re-enter that educational pathway. And um, in that process, also looking at potential barriers to re-entry for whether they are students who had been considering college or not considering college. We talk a lot about those transfer students who were in, in, enduring a planned transfer or an unplanned transfer now. So you all have the power to think about what you can be doing to assist those students who were unplanned in their transfer to be a part of your, your institution or those who are still trying to figure out if college is something that they can manage at this particular time. They have a laundry list of, of priorities that do not involve college. How can we make that entry a little bit more palatable for them and that it's not just a re-entry to get them to fill those um, enrollment gaps, but rather a re-entry that also then supports them through to that completion that you all um, and we are so committed to as well. So when you think about, I can't possibly influence this, but you you can. You can really examine what those re-entry points are and how we can reach back into our communities to bring those individuals along in a way that is manageable for them where they are right now. Yeah, even the, even the, the mere, uh, you know, your mere presence in meetings on campus where you bring up either whatever it might be, the, the needs of a neo-traditional student, the need of community college transfer students, the needs of other kinds of transfers, just bringing that up is gonna be key. Why? Because nobody else is thinking about it. Um, everybody on this call is thinking about it, um, but all of us have to be in those meetings. And it may simply be, oh, we never, we never thought about that or, or, or we thought about it differently. And then when you bring the research to bear in this book, as well as in others, that in fact, most of the students going forward are going to be transfer students of some ilk. Colleges and universities um, have to figure out what that looks like. You know, there was a GAO report, this is three or four years ago now, about uh, a credit transfer. And it's actually a really good report. I think you can Google it, it pull it right up. And for those of you who are, are <laughs> into government reports, I think it's very telling that, in fact, the transfer of credit, for instance, one of the key reasons why students don't move along is problematic in every connection. So I know four years get hammered for this and some of them ought to get hammered for this, but honestly, two years weren't doing a very good job either in terms of how they accepted credit as well. So we all have a responsibility to think about what those policies look like, think about how they work humanistically for our students and then also as part of a degree granters or people providing the impetus um, to advance students towards their degrees. So uh, there's a lot of work done. If you could just be in those meetings, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a great start. So true. And the report he just referenced, um, thankfully, Judith, thank you for putting that in the chat, but uh, the government accountability so good. office. Yep. And it is, it is timeless. I, I think it is it's very eye-opening. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. That, um, it, it's still certainly con continuing. And, you know, when you're, if you're an enrollment officer and you are thinking about, I have to fill my class, and, and, and we talk about transfer students, these are students that you don't have to convince of the value of higher education. They want to pursue their degree. They want to be a part of this. Um, and, and so getting them into your institution and then most importantly, figuring out how to help them um, maneuver, whether it is in, in um, you know, improving that transfer climate and ensuring that you have inclusivity across the college experience for them is really important. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. It is, we have, <clears throat> it's about 10 till the hour and we wanted to open it up for questions. There are some in the, in the Q&A right now. I want to also guide your eye to the chat 
for those of you who've been asking very important questions about PLA and how then if you have a robust PLA, but you're having trouble with your receiving institutions, granting credit for those. Um, Rose Rojas did um, author a chapter in a recent book by the Gardner Institute that talks about PLA. Um, you'll see her pop up in there. Um, she's also one of our advisory board members and, and has a really um, strong commitment to this and has some really good how to's as well. So check out the chat if that's something of interest to you and know that you have Rose as a resource as both Steve and Eileen champion PLA as well. And I love how the captioning says Pele because, you know, you can't ever talk about <laughs> soccer enough, but um, yeah, absolutely, it's really fun. It's <laughs> really fun. Um, so throw your questions in there and let's see. So I'm curious if there's any research out there or reasoning as to why it seems like transfer students are pushed aside with merit scholarship opportunities. Really good point. I, you know, we brought it up, uh, Eileen mentioned earlier about financial aid. Scholarships are an important part of that. And then the question is on to say, at least for the schools I've worked for, at first year institutions earn up to 6,000, but students are capped at 2,000. So disheartening as someone who's trying to support transfer students. So could either of you um, entertain kind of that notion? We know it to be true. That's not, it, it's not unique to this particular institution that is being referenced on, I, I know, um, but what are some ways perhaps that folks can advocate and maybe even as you said, Steve, point out these differences because maybe they haven't been noted. No, I, I completely agree. Thanks for the shout out. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We see some discrepancies along those lines with merit scholarships between between first year students and transfer students. And and oftentimes, uh, you know, so, sometimes it's based on a, sort of a misunderstanding of how long students are actually going to be in school. Um, if it was tied actually uh, more to uh, credits earned or credits brought in, that might be uh, more appropriate. But, but the point is for your institution, pointing that out is going to be key. Also, coming out of this pandemic as well, there's also been some significant rethinking about what financial aid ought to look like, what how financial aid ought to be awarded. And I think we're going to a much more holistic view of, of what that might look like. Obviously, there's federal and state guidelines around, um, you know, uh, the leveling of, of financial aid and, and who needs it most. I get that. But there's also a broader understanding that people bring different kinds of lives with them as well. And it's that sort of need for professional judgment among our professional, our, our financial aid uh, uh, colleagues that'll be key. But, but thank you for calling that out because it's a very important point. I would build on that also by saying philanthropy makes a difference. Um, you know, in the last two years, I've seen a growth in my institution of 114% in transfer matriculated students. So just enormous. And uh, I wish I could say it was because of a lot of, um, a, a lot of fabulous inventive things I've done, um, but actually it's philanthropy and addressing just the problem that, um, that the questioner uh, brought to the table, which is being able to provide transfer student specific scholarships and being able to advertise that and letting students, then they, they feel valued. They, it really transforms um, the way that they feel received by the institution. So I, I urge you also to um, work with your deans, work with development officers to see if transfer can really become a philanthropic priority because it really is the way to transform our, our students' lives. And in that process, I mean, the messaging and the, the data is so very important so that you can tell an appropriate story to these potential philanthropists. You all do make mention of the critical nature of transfer data. Do you want to speak to that for just a moment, please? Uh, data is going to be key for, you know, you're on a college campus, right? So um, data is <laughs> data is, is essential and key. Um, yeah, we can lead with a few anecdotes if we'd like, but but honestly, the, the data are all in our favor. So we really need to lead with the data, um, both in terms of the students who are going to be coming to us in the future, both in terms of their specific needs, whether they be low income or, 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 or need other kinds of supports. So when you bring that to bear, and I love that Eileen brought up the idea of philanthropy, philanthropists love of that. And in fact, I've seen more interest now than ever from a, a variety of philanthropies that didn't know, uh, you know, a, a transfer student from a brick wall who are now very much focused on that constituency. Why? Because it's precisely in their wheelhouse. It's precisely in the place where they want to spend their money. They just didn't 
know it. Okay. So they're going to need you folks to bring that up. Now, Eileen's had a lot more experience doing the philanthropy work, but, but would you agree? I mean, it just seems to me that there's more interest around that than ever. There is. And, um, you know, I've, one of the most touching things is that philanthropists will say, you know, I could be helping out, uh, you know, the, the kid of my, my neighbor. I really would rather provide this paid internship to someone who wouldn't have it otherwise. Do you have a transfer student that really needs a, a pathway into a career? Um, so I do think that whether it is time, talent, or treasure, that there's a lot of interest in really trying to have a more just and equitable pathway for students. And the acknowledgement that there are big gaps. There are big gaps in terms of time to degree, in terms of degree completion for any of the neo-traditional students and the intersectionality only compounds some of those. Um, right now, for instance, if you're a single mom and trying to complete a baccalaureate degree, the, uh, the graduation rates are still in the single digits. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of work to do and yet the return on investment is so high. Um, and when you provide these data about how that return and how you're really not just transforming that student, but also their family, it's, it's a compelling case. And I, I'd like to think it's one that, that none of us on this call could resist. Janet, I know time is, is coming to a close, but one of one of the folks uh, questioned about the data where we got some of the data. Uh, we went to a variety of sources, two I'll just call out, but there's many, many more. One is, of course, the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, we use a lot of their data. They they actually track transfers in the kind of complexity that all of us, I think, can appreciate. The other one, I'll give a shout out to my colleagues at the College Board, who every year put out trends in a student aid, um, trends in college financing. Um, uh, independent data that sort of presents all of the things that we'd be talking about in, in, in very stark terms. So either one of those organizations have data at hand that will help you make the case uh, for transfer students or neo-transfer students on your campuses. Great resources. And the, the other thing that I love about webinars and uh, the abilities to con convene like this is that we learn so much from one another. And I do hope you all have been following the chat because there have been some really good. I've been taking notes, Janet. Yeah, I've been taking there, notes. It's no been great. Doubt. I love it. I learn from the chat every single time. I'm like, how fabulous. We really need to be talking about. Um, there was a comment in there about how sometimes newer professionals or folks who might be new to an institution may not feel comfortable really asserting themselves around issues just yet. And the more often that you can use your sphere of influence and bring those people together and talk about it collectively makes a difference. So don't feel like just because you can't speak as an individual just yet, that your voice can't be critical in the whole um, process of making transfer issues a really a strong point at your institution. Um, so we, we do have just enough time for Eileen and Steve to wave their magic wand, not to tell us what needs to be implemented first per se, but I would like for you to um, wave your magic wand and if you can make things better for those out there who are working so hard on behalf of transfer students. What would you say to the administration to help those student those um, student advocates do their jobs better? What would you say to those folks in decision making positions? Um, um, what conditions would need to be there and what support would need to be there for our amazing professionals who are working so hard for our students? Child care, child care, child care. <laughs> Um, I would say know your own data, um, you know, for at each institution, wherever you are being, the, being uh, in control and knowledgeable about your own institution's data, even if it's just on the national education um, statistics uh, that are published and do disaggregate for, for transfer students, um, being able to understand the graduation differentials um, for first gen, for race, ethnicity, for Pell eligible students will really allow you to invest your own resources and targeted programming that can really have a proactive rather than reactive effect. Um, so, you know, that knowing your own data will guide your own actions. And um, just thank you for trying to make a difference. So great advice for anyone at any level at an institution or organization, know your data, know your students, know their pain points, know where they're coming into and leaving your institution, whether by choice or by circumstance. 
and um, find your allies and those other advocates and those other transfer champions across your campuses and your institutions to band together on behalf of this really important population of our, our neo-traditional students. So Steve and Eileen, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and sharing your wisdom around free community college, or, or excuse me, beyond free college right here. Um, so important to think both broadly, but then more specifically about how we each have a role in creating um, the opportunities for our students to be those proven scholars and to excel in ways that we know they're capable of. So thank you both. Thank you for all of you for joining us today. Just a quick reminder, this will be recorded and put um, a link to the NISTS webpage in a couple of days. So, thank you, Janet. Thanks Thank to all. Much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.